Okay, come on, Greg. You can do this. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> this is going to be very different from anything I've ever made. Quick, somebody talk me out of this. Now, I know that I promised I was going to make my own conspiracy theory video, but this really got out of hand on me. I started off with just writing a script for a single video, laying out my new favorite conspiracy theory. Before I knew it, I'd gone full Charlie, laying out my own personal grand unified theory for all conspiracy theories that ever existed. Oh my god. Welcome to the Armored Conspiracy Files. Does that sound dumb? I'm keeping it. Please debate with each other in the comments section. I'm just trying to have some fun and thought you guys would have some fun too. The conspiracy theory that sort of got me started into the whole genre way back in the day was the Giza Plateau. The Great Pyramid, the Red Pyramid, the Sphinx, and of course dozens of other structures, tunnels, and sites. Based on everything that we know on the historical progression of mankind, there's no way the dynastic Egyptians could have built the Great Pyramid in the time period that history records with the tools they had at their disposal with the materials they built it with in the amount of time. The stones, the layers of the Great Pyramid, three-dimensionally lock into each other, and there are 2.3 million multi-ton limestone blocks. Academia says that it was likely constructed over the course of 25 years. If that's the case, you would have to cut, move, and fit into place one block every two minutes. Not to mention how complex the design is, incorporating the golden ratio, incorporating the math for the dimensions of the Earth, including the distance of the Earth from the sun. It's in the geographical center of the earth, pointing due north. The Great Pyramid isn't four-sided, it's eight-sided. There's also the large granite blocks that are integrated to the interior of the pyramid that there's no way the dynastic Egyptians could have worked with. Copper is just going to blunt on granite. I can't believe it's going to cut the stone. We're going to put sand inside the groove and we're going to put this saw on top of the sand and then let the sand do the cutting. Will we see any progress in our lifetime? Yes, um, if you came back in an hour's time, you would see about a four millimeter cut. Sign went wonderful once we switched over to using uh, water with the sand. As you can see here, we achieved this in just a few days. And even if they did cut them like that, that doesn't explain how the blocks fit so flush with each other. You can't even fit a piece of paper or a needle between them. Go right next door to the Sphinx. Not only is the body of the Sphinx far more eroded than the head, suggesting that the head was actually recarved at a later date, but the walls around the Sphinx display advanced water erosion. Egyptologists believe that the Sphinx is between three and 5,000 years old. However, some geologists have suggested that the water erosion would require hundreds of years of sustained rainfall. And the last time Egypt had a climate that would explain something like that was between 10 and 20,000 years ago. Meaning that the Great Sphinx is at least 12,000 years old. And it was when I heard about all this that I became forever addicted to unraveling the mysteries of ancient human history and trying to piece together a new timeline that actually explains everything that we see with our own eyes. The first time I heard about the water erosion around the Sphinx, I was only about 12 or 13 years old, but I remember it vividly. The people who presented the theory were mocked and ridiculed, and the fallout from the debate forced a spotlight onto an uncomfortable and major flaw in the archaeological community, their refusal to accept evidence that doesn't fit the accepted historical paradigm. But a lot has happened since the 90s, and our paradigm has shifted quite a bit, mainly because of the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, a pre-Neolithic civilization that predates the oldest known civilization, Sumeria, by around 7,000 years. Most people recognize Graham Hancock. He's basically the face of lost ancient history. I'm not really a huge fan, but I can't deny what he's done for the field. However, he and a few others in the field seem stuck, quite ironically, on an old, unflexible paradigm themselves. Also, John Anthony West, concerned with unpacking this lost civilization, and solving the riddle of the Sphinx. And then there's Brian Forster. He's the one that woke me up to the fact that many megalithic sites have amazing stonework that we can't explain, but on top of that amazing stonework, there's terrible stonework that the world's sh 
Matthias Mason wouldn't put his name on today. There's more to it than that. That's an oversimplification, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that a lot of these sites, like the ones in Peru, were actually built a long time ago, then abandoned for some time, and then reoccupied later by the Maya and the Inca. And the Maya and the Inca even have stories themselves about how their cities were built by the gods. For example, this wall has extremely complicated cuts in the stone. Each stone is wedged so tightly together that you can't fit a piece of paper between. But behind the surface, the stones appear to have been melted into each other like Play-Doh. These design features make the wall almost earthquake-proof. Not that I ever took it too seriously, but I always followed research on the idea of Atlantis, the concept of this ancient advanced civilization that was wiped away by a flood, and we keep finding these hints. Later, I'd find out about the Younger Dryas period, a time about 12,000 years ago when the North Pole suddenly melted and then refroze, and at the same time, there's a noticeable rise and lowering of sea level, and the extinction of a good deal of megafauna in North America. That is, I didn't take this too seriously until just recently there was discovered a comet impact crater in southern Greenland from 12 thousand years ago. When that baby hit, it would have vaporized a good deal of the ice cap that would have rained down on the Earth for months. And because of its close proximity to the Arctic Ocean, that impact would have caused a massive tsunami that would have wiped across a good deal of the Northern Hemisphere. Together, those two effects would have made it seem as if there was a massive global flood. This helped to explain some of the impressive carvings that we found at Gobekli Tepe, which seems to depict the story of a great comet. Comets have always been considered bad omens throughout history, and perhaps that's because collectively we have a historical memory of this major impact event. So, if this is true when we've unlocked Atlantis, and we've managed to prove that they were more advanced than later civilizations, does that mean that they were completely wiped away by the flood, or did some of their knowledge survive? And why do the Freemasons and countless other occult groups venerate the pyramid? Do they know what it means? So that got me thinking. If the Inca and the Maya could end up occupying cities that they themselves didn't build, but history would record it as if they did, do you think the same thing could happen to us? But I didn't just find patterns with the building layouts, I found entire themes that survived from Egypt all the way to the Victorian era. And I know that sounds crazy, but a lot of the major architectural styles that existed between those two eras are actually tied together. So that means this whole thing ties into the Notre Dame spire. Notre Dame was built with all the same principles as the Giza Plateau and served the same function. And now with the spire gone, it no longer does function. Whoa, what am I saying? You're talking crazy, Greg. And if I'm right, which I probably am. This will destroy everything you know about human history and who we were before the Victorian era. This is one of the temple structures in Royal Palace Park, Cambodia. What you're seeing and what you're hearing, as far as I know, is not real. All the sources of this video lead to a single Flat Earth YouTube account, and the owner of that account told me that he doesn't remember where he got it. But let's look at this as a proof of concept. In theory, what the creator wants to convey is that atmospheric energy is being collected by a fractal antenna on the roof of the building, and that the reaction is causing an audible resonance. Those balls of light that are floating around are supposed to be plasma. This, theoretically, is a free energy device that's been integrated into an old building. And this seems kind of silly, but there's people out there who believe that this kind of technology not only existed back then, but has existed all throughout human history. And through the majority of human history have been integrating this technology into their buildings all across the world until all knowledge of this history was erased. 
200 years ago. The Illuminati has apparently accomplished this by capitalizing on massive natural disasters like floods, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and mudslides, and then just cleaned up the mess and made up a story about a plague or a war to explain all the bodies, and fake fires to explain all the missing buildings. They then collect and reuse the old masonry to build the next civilization. Masonry? Lying around? Free for the taking? Just as any old mason could just take this for free. Just all this free masonry lying around. You know what I'm saying? History tells us that this is a photo of a destroyed city after a civil war battle. But what if this is an old abandoned city that was destroyed by an earthquake and fire or a solar flare or some other natural disaster? What if they just found the city like this and then rebuilt it and called it their own. What else seems to stick out about these older buildings in these historic towns is that they seem to be slightly buried into the earth and a little bit more than what you'd expect from just natural sediment over time. As if mud had just flowed into the city and filled in the lower levels of all these buildings. And that brings me to the name of this conspiracy theory. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you to the Mud Flood. Ever since high school, I've been obsessed with history. Why history? I don't know. I've just always absorbed it like a sponge. Straight out of high school, I ended up taking a summer job as a tour bus operator, and that was perfect because Kingston, my hometown, is actually a historic city with French settlers dating back to about 1673, and that helped me really carve my teeth on my knowledge from around that era to about 1850. That was around the time that all the interesting stuff happened in Kingston. Nothing's really happened since then. Oh, a, a waiter here was the first Canadian Idol. So... Yeah. And now I know Kingston like the back of my hand. The tourism industry reigns supreme here, and as my role as a tour operator, I ended up getting to access parts of the city that most people don't even know exist. It turns out that I am actually uniquely qualified to discuss the mud flood conspiracy theory because most of the structures they discuss date between the 16 and 1800s, and they share features with several structures here in Kingston. There's a lot of different concepts that the mud flood theory tries to incorporate some of the stuff I've just completely stayed away from because it just seems like nonsense. But I'm going to go through as many of the more interesting and more plausible theories as I can in this video. But this series is inevitably going to grow because there are several subjects that I want to make an entire video just focusing on. Yes, they all realize that most buildings have basement windows, but even then decorative features such as arches are buried under the earth and nobody would design a building like that. The conspiracy theory community uses the term mud flood, but that could mean several things. Landslides, mud volcanoes, yes that's a thing, and a powerful enough earthquake can shake the soil to the point where it liquefies. I suppose we have to consider the possibility that that's sediment that's been built up over time, but cities get buried under the earth all the time. Now nobody in the mud flood community can seem to agree on whether or not there were several mud floods or just one, and if they all happened at the same time around the world, but the mud flooders present some pretty compelling evidence that almost every single one of these cities has been buried under at least one story of mud. And that there is no record of this happening. And this is all around the world. Russia, France, England, Japan, China, Singapore, Australia, Turkey, India, South America, Mexico, United States, Canada. It's common knowledge that Rome was buried under feet of earth. Egypt was buried, of course. Using this logic, I went around my hometown to see if I noticed the same thing. And you know what? I did. In in fact, almost every single feature these mud flood cities have resemble Kingston, Ontario. Most original structures that stand today date between 1830 and 1850. There's a big mess though because before the Kingston Heritage Committee was created, they would just level buildings 
indiscriminately. Now you have to do an archaeological dig every single time you want to build something downtown, and every single time they end up finding foundations for older structures. One thing mud flutters will do is they'll start throwing photos at you of just random people excavating mud. Some of them, completely out of context, makes it seem like maybe they're just digging out a buried city. But others, you can't really deny that that's what they're doing. Here's an anomaly for you in Omaha. This is St. Mary Magdalene Church. The city apparently decided to regrade the streets and level out all of the steep hills. So people started digging out the church, and after they finished excavating it, they discovered that two stories of the structure were submerged under the earth. Do you see where these faux pillars flare out at the bottom? This is an indication of where the ground level should be. And you see this side? All these beautiful arched windows? Okay, well, this one's actually an easy debunk. An article in the Omaha World Herald says that during the street grading, they hired a contractor to build the bottom story and the foundation area. However, I will admit that it's very strange that they would build a brick foundation for such a tall, heavy structure that's obviously built on soil instead of bedrock, but heh, I'm no building expert. And some of these depictions show grand structures that either seem to be in the middle of no Nowhere, or have no landscaping around them at all. Then there's these photos of cities like the Vatican, where the entire city is completely empty. Yeah, maybe they evacuated the city just to get these pristine shots. If they went through all the trouble to evacuate the entire city, you, you think you think that they could have asked this guy to get out of the shot, maybe? It's a, it's a, it's a little bit awkward that he's just standing there. Oh, oh yeah, you got these vagrants hanging out by the statue over here? Hey guys, get the... Get the f*** out of the shot, you're ruining it! It almost looks like they're taking a photo of the Vatican to show off what it looks like right before they fill it with the next civilization. I want to ask yourself a question. If there's no people in the city, then who took the photo? These should be bustling cities. How do you build up these giant cities if there's no people in them? I mean, this seem to have been a global event, right? Surely there'd be some sort of record of this happening. But instead, there are stories like this. The downtown of the city of Chattanooga is a floodplain and apparently used to flood regularly in the 19th century. This apparently is not so much of an issue anymore, mainly because the street level of the entire downtown was raised. The problem with this is that nobody knows when this street raising was done, where it was done, or how. I don't know exactly when this happened because there are, to my knowledge, no firm records that would objectively show, hey, here's what we did and when we did it. But most people have said this was done sometime in the late 1880s. But the mud flutters are not so sure about the 1880s theory. A handful of photos have survived from the region that predate that time. The fact that this is matched by another window on the other side and there's a door in the middle just tells you that this most likely was an entryway to a business. This guy goes on to show that a retaining wall was built on the outside of the structure, theoretically so that they could add the fill on the other side. However, I also found an old photo of Chattanooga that shows retaining walls used to stop water from entering the building. So I don't really know what to make of this. You can see some of the tops of, of arched window ways that you wouldn't put in at the street level now. Someone has said, well, could those have been coal bins? But you wouldn't have had six of them in the same building. Chattanooga's not the only one in the world. Hell, Chattanooga's not the only one in the United States. It's basically the exact same story in Leavenworth. Now this is downtown Leavenworth, but below my feet, there's an underground mystery down here that not a lot of people know about or can tell us why it was created. It is a city perhaps long ago used for commerce. Windows, doors, and narrow paths lead you to the storefronts. We know that it was pretty secretive, whatever it was that was down here, because not too many people know anything about it. The underground world stretches several city blocks and possibly beyond. Some speculate this was created in the 1800s. Even Kingston City Hall is quite questionable. The whole basement is lined with archways that were buried under the soil until fairly recently. You can see examples of these large arches in the 
west wing, which is the back of the structure, but also all the way along the front of the structure. Almost all of these today have been converted into windows and doors, but the point is that they weren't designed to be covered. Yet in photos from the 1860s, you can clearly see that the building is buried all the way up to the main floor. Market vendors are actually using the main floor as storefronts. You can't even touch those windows today. They're too high up. I never understood why they designed the building like this, because if there was any kind of flooding, it would just pour right into the dry moat. And in the winter, that's exactly what would happen. The dry moat would fill with ice and water, and there was nowhere for it to drain. And now that I've seen pictures of buildings getting excavated, I wonder if the basement of City Hall wasn't designed to be completely above the ground, like it was up on stilts, on display. The subject of aqueducts always comes up with the mud flood community. Greco-Romano style aqueducts seem to be a common feature. For example, there's a Romanesque aqueduct in Mexico. You want aqueducts? Kingston has one of those too. Maybe. Well, technically, it's in Napanee, which is actually 30 minutes outside of Kingston. A small section of this bridge is made of stone. And though there has clearly been some restoration work done to it, especially around the base, which has more concrete, there doesn't seem to be any kind of record of any kind of stone bridge being built here. And there seems to be no record of this restoration. I, I, know, I know this is just probably a bridge. Another thing synonymous with the mud flood is stone. Star forts. There are some pretty intricate designs, and though many still stand today, there are some drawings of older ones that will really blow your mind. Some are really small, like the ones in Kingston. We have a few like Fort Frederick, Fort Henry, that's a bit more of a sizable star fort there. And there's a little bit left of the original French fort, Fort Frontenac. But at one time, the entire city of Kingston was walled off. The oldest depiction of City Hall that I can find, supposedly dating to 1850, shows a wall that we now call the Market Battery. And a small portion of this wall has been excavated, but you'll notice that the wall is actually sunken down, and you have to climb down into a hole to access it. But like I said, all of Kingston was walled off at one point, so that Market Battery would have been attached to the rest of the wall, right? Well, what did that market battery look like? Oh, that looks like a freaking star fort. Have you ever seen the Statue of Liberty? Don't let that cute toga and the shiny flame distract you because Lady Liberty is holding a secret that's completely out in the open. Just, just look, just look down. Lower. No, lower. Oh, no, no, no. No foot stuff. L lower. Y yes, that. The Statue of Liberty is standing on top of a star fort. So there's a theory that some of the really big buildings were constructed by giants. But if they were built by giants, it would explain why they have such high vaulted ceilings and such enormous, gigantic doorways. You know what? Let's save this one for another video. The art of map making is very serious. There are liberties taken. Yes, sometimes islands are misshapen, but map makers were meticulous. They wanted to be as accurate as humanly possible. But then you find stuff like this. What is this? I've asked several Americans, hey, what did your teacher tell you about why California used to be depicted as an island? And they all replied, What? The world used to know California as an island. Again, map makers wouldn't just screw around. People needed these maps to navigate. So why is California an island? Seriously, when I was a kid, I was told that cartographers were mistaken by the peninsula off of Mexico and they just assumed it went on forever. But that doesn't explain these four islands that just happen to perfectly correlate with the largest mountains in that region. Oh, and this is my favorite part. Where's San Francisco? The city by the bay. 
Oh, it's by the bay, but it's by the wrong bay. It's supposed to be at a other bay. So how does that happen? Whatever it was that filled in the strait with Earth, did it cover up the old San Francisco? And since people just remembered the name San Francisco, they're like, yeah, we'll just call one of the new reset cities San Francisco, the city by the bay. And this got me wondering, if this had to do with the streets with no name song. Oh, streets with no name. That's not the song. But I highly encourage you to go through some of these maps because you're gonna find a lot of stuff that surprises you, like entire islands that are just not there anymore, like Freeze Land. There's Greenland, Iceland, and Freeze Land. Except Freeze Land doesn't exist anymore. Is that a secret Illuminati island? I don't know, but I'm going to say yes. Subscribe to my channel. Not that I would ever agree with such a gross oversimplification, but the main group that the mud flood community seems to attribute these structures to is an old empire, the largest empire to ever touch the face of the earth. And you don't even know it exists. Okay, I, 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 I want you guys to sit down for this part because this is true. Tartaria, also known as Tartar or Tartary, is depicted throughout history on several maps, often colored in yellow, and it changes shape and size throughout time as it grew and shrank. Tartary at one time almost took up the entirety of Asia and even parts of Europe, the Middle East and Northern Africa. I didn't even know Tartaria existed until just a couple months ago. A few people have told me that they knew about it, but that they were taught that Tartary is just the word you use to describe wild, uncharted lands? Barbary? Tartary? So Tartaria was supposedly mostly occupied by nomadic tribes, kind of like the Mongolians. Oh, sh**. Tartaria is Genghis Khan's empire, isn't it? So the most baffling thing about Tartaria is how long it seemed to last. Well into the 1700s, and maybe into the 1800s. So the problem with the theory of Tartary just being wild lands is that Tartary has their own flags, their own symbols, their own culture, and there's recorded lineages for their emperors, for uncharted wildlands, they seem pretty well charted. They mark down cities and towns and provinces, mountain ranges and rivers and lakes and forests. If Tartaria was this big, then they must have had a lot of cultural influence throughout the entire world. And this is why the mud flood community believes that every city around the world has the same neoclassical architecture. And Tartary wasn't the only world power, and it's hard to tell just how integrated they really were. See, this is what I'm talking about. There's just too much information for me to go through all in one video. I can't even seem to form a coherent line of thought here. I've always enjoyed these alternate reality conspiracy theories. It sort of reminds me of the electric universe model, which isn't really a conspiracy theory. These are, these are the kinds of puzzles I give myself. And usually when I jump into a new conspiracy theory, it doesn't take that long for my brain to just start naturally rejecting what it's hearing because logic and reason take over. But sometimes when I start to try to debunk something, I can't grasp on anything and I just keep falling deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole. Sometimes that's because the information you're getting is fake, like the UFO phenomenon. And unfortunately, for those that love the mud flood theory, there is a good deal of evidence that this is all manufactured as well. But even not knowing what the sources are for some of these things, some of the photos, even not knowing what the context is, it still leaves you with questions. It still leaves you wondering, what the f are these cursed images? The whole concept of ancient aliens actually comes from a string of common stories from cultures all around the world of these people that came and taught them culture and law and technology. And oddly, several of these cultures actually depict these gods very similarly as bearded men that carried little purses and had like a little doodad in their hand. I don't know what that means. I'm betting whatever the purse and the doodad are, 
are the same thing as the orb and the scepter. I think that these gods were actually just survivors of Atlantis, and they brought Atlantean technology and the knowledge that Atlantis had accumulated. But I'm having so much trouble trying to fit it all in right now. Like, I don't know if they were trying to rebuild Atlantis. For example, were the pyramids in Mexico already there before the Atlanteans showed back up? Or when they showed up, did they build a brand new style of architecture? Yeah, I'm just having trouble trying to make this whole conspiracy theory work. If the Tartarians, if they're the ones that built all the neoclassic, neo-Gothic style architecture, then who built the original Greek and Roman stuff? Around the time that I started looking into the mud flood, the movie Aquaman came out. And that's when I started to wonder why Atlantis is always depicted as having Greco-Roman architecture. I mean, yeah, it's dumb to assume that all the artists that have ever depicted Atlantis know that they're depicting Atlantis as Greco-Roman. So this is where we integrate the conspiracy theory that we have the historical timeline completely wrong. One book that has like a whole series of equations that you can use to figure out what the astronomical layout was at the time that the structure was built or that the events happened so that you can tell what time period that it was supposed to really happen in. Sir Isaac Newton was actually one of the proponents of this theory and he believed events like those that happened in the Greco-Roman times happened in more the medieval era. Some people, they like to add around a thousand years. I only really have like two heroes in science, and that's Nikola Tesla and Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> There's a few different theories about how the history timeline got screwed up, and there's so many different places that they could have added time. If you stretch time out, I guess it would be sort of like a stick of gum. It would break in a bunch of different places, but there wouldn't be one chunk with, had the most stretch. That was a bad metaphor. But some time periods in their entirety are questionable, like the Dark Ages. There's so little written history for the Dark Ages that it's possible that it just never happened. And I mean, all of England's history around the time that Rome supposedly left is really questionable. That's why their history is replaced with the story of freaking King Arthur and the Round Table. That's fiction. That's not real. But that's their history. There's a lot of competing theories to how this time was changed, but the most commonly used argument was that Pope Sylvester II and Emperor Ottoman III, glad I remembered that, they teamed up and basically added years to history so that they could say that they were the rulers at the turn of the millennium into the year 1000. One of the theories is that the entire Roman Empire is a lie and that it's a giant cover-up to explain missing Tartaria history, missing history for other empires and nations and, and kingdoms that are gone now. But that's a hard pill to swallow because there is so much written history and archaeological evidence that Rome existed. So sorry that I can't really buy into that one, guys. What I can believe, though, is that Rome had this technology. So if Greece is in the Middle Ages, then how does it really fit in? Where's that architecture come from? According to the stories of Plato, some guy told Socrates that his grandfather went to Egypt a long time ago, and a priest told him about an ancient Egyptian empire, and that's how we know about Atlantis. The Egyptians supposedly came from an ancient island chain known as Hyperborea. These were the people that supposedly built the pyramids all across the world. This story is kind of a riddle. In fact, the entire oral tradition of verbally telling stories of history is kind of a game, and we've totally lost the context of how to translate it. The story also includes subtle subliminal hints that are supposed to subvert a listener's critical thinking skills. For example, the fact that Plato added three degrees of separation and then a great deal of time to the story. You'd think that that would make the story less believable, but subconsciously it actually makes it more believable. Believe it or not, hearing that the story came from a wise old man makes it seem more credible, because wise old men are credible, even though they haven't even demonstrated that this wise old man 
even exists. Historians believe that Plato concocted this story as a way to inspire the Greeks because it's about coming together and rising up against adversity and about how arrogance is crippling and will end up sinking you in the end. But it's hard to tell because the entire art form of oral history telling is just dead. So the story of Atlantis apparently continued on with a story of another empire that followed up afterwards and then was struck down by lightning. I wonder if that's supposed to be Babylon? And Babylon, or at least the Tower of Babel, is always depicted as being Greco-Roman. Maybe the Greeks were actually just using old Babylonian technology. Anyways, I know, I know this was a weird video. I didn't really, like, debunk anything. I like to be as skeptical of this stuff as possible, but really I need to set this up for you. Otherwise, the whole rest of the series won't make any sense. Part 2 is going to be really good though. That's probably gonna be my favorite video in the series. I'm going to be going into Nikola Tesla, his Tesla Tower technology, what he was trying to do with that. And not, not that I wanna say I'm smarter than Tesla or anything, but I figured out what he was doing wrong. The technology that Tesla was using to draw atmospheric energy out of the sky, which is a real thing. I'm gonna be going into all the science of that. I'm gonna demonstrate how Tesla's design was kind of backwards. He had this idea of providing free energy to the entire planet, but the main thing that we need to see is if Tesla's concept of free energy could work within the domed buildings. Yeah, you could fit a Tesla tower inside of one of these domed buildings, but is that like, something that they actually did. Was this free energy a real thing? If there's one thing that I might accidentally convince you of in this series, it'll be the free energy thing. Because even I'm like almost convinced, like this close to being convinced that our ancestors had free energy and we can't see it. Well, I can, because I'm a genius. I'm gonna wake you idiots up too. Everyone will see what I see. I'm really looking forward to seeing how you guys react to this series. I hope you have fun with each other, debating in the comments section. Remember guys, this is just for fun. And next time, I'm gonna teach you guys how to build a free energy device better than Tesla.